Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Just get it at the right height. There we go. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the Johannesburg or Josie 2015 committee for inviting me to speak here this afternoon. Uh, it's a great. I must admit, confess, whatever you want to call it, I haven't spoken to um, a gathering of this magnitude. So if I'm a little bit nervous, it's because I am. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Helping others is the foundation of our sobriety. And basically, um, you know, what that means to me is that, uh, well, I'm going to be speaking to you this afternoon a little bit about service. Um, I, um, I came into these rooms um, some time ago, and I came in quite loaded. Well, not, not loaded with alcohol, a little bit of it, but um, with anxiety and with, um, with, with some trepidation. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I'd been thinking about the fact that I had a little bit of a problem and maybe I should do something about it. So um, in my hometown, Benoni, where I, where I live, um, I went to the airfield meeting the one evening. It was way back in 2001. And I wasn't quite sure whether I should, uh, I should go into the, meeting, into the meeting hall. So I phoned my sister, and um, that voice at the other end of the line left me in no doubt whatsoever that I should actually haul, myself, haul my ass out of my car and get into that meeting. And I must say, I, I don't regret that for one minute. Um, when I walked into the rooms, as I said, I was, I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect, et cetera, et cetera. I, um, I said to the folks that evening in the meeting, I said to them, I, I'm not really an alcoholic. I'm just a substance abuser. Well, half the folks fell off their chairs laughing. The other, the other half just smirked. And then at the end of the meeting, the love that I got from that group of people to explain to me that I had a disease called alcoholism made me feel a whole lot better. And that's, you know, that's what AA for, is all about for me. It's all about, um, about the love and the understanding that we find in these rooms, the solution that we find in the rooms, the, the knowledge, the inspiration, the hope, the motivation, but mainly the fact that there is a solution. I had a, I'd found that there is recovery. It was not a medical cure because there is no medical cure. Um, there was no tablet that I could take, no magic pill, uh, no injection that would relieve me of the hopelessness and of the despair and of the darkness that I'd experienced, particularly in my last, uh, in, in my last hours of binging. You know, there's, uh, there's nothing worse than than, than sitting wondering in your lounge where this is all going to end or how this is going to end. And fortunately for me, two fellows from AA came to visit me, um, and they looked around and they said to me, you know, Joseph, do you want to lose this? Do you want to lose that? And, and my answer was an emphatic no. Obviously, I didn't want to lose my house. didn't want to lose my car. didn't want to lose my job. Um, I tried to lose the wife, but that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> but um, but the folks were kind. They were understanding. They were sympathetic. They were empathetic. They were compassionate, and they they welcomed me into the rooms and they showed me the way. They showed me how I can recover if if I if I did a few things. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path, and um, um, that's that's what I try to do. That's what I try and do. Still today, I, I try and follow the path. Now, to me, AA, uh, the twelve-step program, and has is my uh, my life magazine. My uh, it's it's my recovery vehicle, and um, I think thus far I've done I've done fairly I've done fairly okay in that. I'm deviating from my script somewhat, so just give me a, a minute here. Um, my my initial entrance into, in, into AA, um, I stayed for probably about eight months or so. But being arrogant and a little bit rebellious, because that's just my nature, if there's a, uh, a shortcut, I'll do the shortcut. If there's a corner to cut, I'll do that. And I, I, I can best describe my, 
my, my first attempt at getting sober is that I did not do step one properly. I didn't accept that I was an alcoholic. So when I came back to a, when I came back to AA some 18 months later, I I sat down, I listened, I shut up, I read, I went to meetings, and and I listened. And I think that was the lesson that I had to learn. I first had to go out there and experiment. And what the folks had told me is that you know you can go out drinking again. That's not a problem. Um, but it, things will get worse. And in AA we speak of that of that little word yet. It's about that long, it's got three letters, but you know, it's about that high. And and things started happening to me that hadn't happened to me prior. Um, and and I life became intolerable. My life really did become unmanageable. And when I came back into AA in two thousand and three, and by the grace of God I haven't had a drink for over twelve years, um, I I sat down and I and I listened to these folks and they spoke to me. And they they guided me and they imparted knowledge. And I think that's what I'm most grateful for. And that's what I'd like to see us all doing. And, you know, AA does have the saying, I am responsible. And there's a lot of intellectual property that we have um, that we pass down, if I can term it, from generation to generation. And it doesn't matter what service we do or how we do it, um, but it's good to do service. For me, service has aided me in my recovery. From an early age, in sobriety, in AA, I have got involved, whether it be um, at group level, um, setting up the hall, um, setting up the chairs, setting out the tables, putting out the tea and coffee, um, doing kitchen duty afterwards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, um, you know, I learned a lot in that kitchen. I learned an awful lot in that kitchen. It is a learning ground of note, and I see one of the airfield members nodding their head here in the audience. Um, it, it really, there is a wealth of fun and banter and joking around, but there's also seriousness, you know. Alcoholism is, it's, it's a tough thing. It's a, it's a cruel thing. It's cunning, it's baffling, and it's powerful. And in the rooms where we are, wherever we are, where it's in the Cape KwaZulu-Natal, uh, in in, in um, Gauteng, wherever we may find ourselves, where we seek the solution, um, the rooms provide that solution. And the kitchen was the place where it really began in all earnestness for me. Um, people people have a wealth of knowledge, and um, and it's great to be able to listen to uh, newcomers, to medium termers, to old timers, um, whatever uh, what, wherever we find ourselves in our sobriety. Um, I will never have a complete recovery. Let's, I won't be cured, let's put it that way. But I do have a vehicle for recovery. And, and, I, like, and I like to do the service that I do. It's my passion. AA became my passion. The second time around when I entered these rooms, I realized that I was dealing with something serious. And that if I wanted to, to get sober, I had to be serious about it. And rarely have we seen a person, fa person fail who has thoroughly followed our path, be took on real meaning for me. When I, when I sobered up, they said to me also, they said, find something to do. Because my habit was, I couldn't wait for half past four, because that's when I knocked off. And I worked for a company that was spread throughout southern Africa. We had depots all over. And at half past four, wherever I may find myself, whether it was in Botswana, in Francis Town, or if it was um, in Germiston, or if it was in Cape Town, or in Durban, at half past four at the depot, we would be in the pub, or five o'clock, whatever the time might be. So, you know, it was a bit of a, I was an afternoon alcoholic, I guess. Um, and I couldn't wait for those times. So when I stopped drinking, and I, and I wanted to stay stopped drinking, they said to me, find something to do. And that's when I made AA my passion and I got involved in service. And doing things, helping other people, provides me with great joy. From 12-stepping, 12, 12 I've had some horrendous moments 12-stepping. I've been threatened with guns. I've been run off properties. But it did not deter me from trying to help other people. Because somewhere, well, at, when, when I needed that help, it was available. Somebody took the time out to sit with me to explain to me how this program works and what AA can do. 
as long as I followed a bit of a recipe. Um, and I suppose as alcoholics, well, this alcoholic in particular, I needed some structure in my life at that time. And that structure st uh, stood me in good stead. So service became the name of the game. Um, I've served at group level. I've served at area level. Um, I'm now serving at national level. Um, I got I got at I got into national service if I could put it that way. It was not the military service. I managed to skip that part. Um, I I got involved with the publications with Rechmarker, with AA and SA and Alka Solo, and I can't tell you what joy that gives me. Now, when it came to making career choices, when my folks said to me at that age, they said, well, you know, Joseph, what are you going to do with your life? Alcohol, alcoholism didn't pop up as a career choice. But what did pop up was I wanted to be a writer, I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to be a journalist, I wanted to be a lawyer, all those fine things. Anyway, my, uh, my folks dissuaded me from those choices. I registered for a BCom at university. Um, but I quickly changed that to a social science degree, lots of social, very little science. And I, I, managed, I managed to get that degree. It took me five years to get a three-year degree, during which time my sister got two degrees. And when I spoke to my folks, I said to them, you know, I've actually saved you some money. So instead of you coming down for like uh, two ceremonies, two years in a row, you come down to a double ceremony. They didn't see the humor. And uh, I don't know why, because I thought it was, it was a good cost-saving measure. Anyway, uh, university was quite a fertile ground uh, to learn how to drink. Uh, students, Eastern Cape students in particular, I was in Grahamstown. Um, when we weren't studying, and that was quite often, we were drinking. That was quite, that was frequently. Anyway, I digress. Um, so I've been involved with, with the Rechmark now for some time, and I'm going to do a bit of PRO with you guys. And um, I see the lights flashing. Uh, I'm gonna, the Rechmark is a wonderful medium. And so is the Alco Solo, and so is AA and SA. Um, to know what is going on in AA, um, it's also uh, for the loners, there's the meeting in print. And the Rechmarker, if I could appeal to the folks here, this is the PRO, but please send your contributions. There must be about 700 of you sitting here, so I can expect about 700 contributions after convention, and we probably won't have to beg you for articles for the next three years, but that's good. We'll have some stock. Um, but get involved in service, folks. It's, um, I don't do this to get thanked. I don't do this to get rewards. I do this because it helps me stay sober. And I know there are people out there that say um, that you shouldn't base your sobriety on, um, on just doing service. And it's true to a certain extent. But for me, my, my vehicle and my path of recovery is to do service. And I really and I thoroughly enjoy it. And I'm, I'm urging and I'm appealing to folks that if there's a service position available in the, on the, in the area in which you, which you are sobering up in or where you live, please take it, take it up with, uh, take it up, um, with, without, um, thinking about it. Uh, we do find it difficult to fill, full service positions, but it is actually a very good way to, to start your sobriety and to keep your sobriety. And this red light is flashing consistently, so I think they're saying to me, you must now shut up. So I will shut up. And thank you very much for being here. It's great to see this turnout here um, at convention this year in Josie. I hope the numbers will repeat themselves in consequent and subsequent um, conventions. Hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Thank you very much for listening to me. But there is one thing in my, in my little script that I just want to share with you. And it's probably more apt that it should be read out at a morning meeting. But it goes, it's a little prayer that I found, and it goes like this. Dear God, so far today, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, moody, selfish, or overindulgent. I am thankful for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm probably going to need help. Amen. Thank you for listening to me. Good afternoon. My name is Frank, and I am an alcoholic. And it's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I, it's a good place to be. I, our topic, I better look at it. The topic for this afternoon 
Helping others is the foundation of our sobriety. I was told I had to speak on that topic by Fonny, and I always listen to Fonny. So, helping others is the foundation of my sobriety. There's not much more else to say. It is the foundation of my sobriety. But I have to talk until the lights start, so I'll, I'll speak about some other stuff, and let's see where we go. Um, I, I told you that I'm an alcoholic, and I'm not an alcoholic because I drink two bottles of scotch a day, or I drink a bottle of vodka, or I drink in the morning, or I drink on my own, or I drink meths out of a brown paper bag, or any of those things. I'm an alcoholic, not because I, so, not because I have a problem with alcohol. I'm, al I'm an alcoholic because I have a problem with me, and I use alcohol to solve that problem. And for a long time it worked. Really did. It was good for me. But then that started to change. I understand that I have a reaction to alcohol that is different from other people, both physically and mentally. I understand that physically, when I pick up one drink, I immediately want two drinks. When I pick up two drinks, I want four. And when I have four drinks, it is no up but, you know, and there's no stopping me. And then, then I develop a craving for alcohol. I hear people talk about being addicted to alcohol. I'm not convinced that I was addicted to alcohol. But when I started drinking, then I was addicted. And unless you drank like I did, you have no idea what that craving is like. It became my most important thing in my life was the next drink. And that seemed to happen to me every time I picked up, picked up a drink. And I understand now that that is a physical reaction to alcohol that is different. And about 10% of us as alcoholics have that. And if that was my only problem, then it would be easier. I just simply not pick up a drink. That would be it. But that is where my main problem comes in. And the book tells me that the main problem of the alcoholic is in his mind. And it's in my mind that I have my, my main problem. I don't like being sober. When I'm not drinking, what happens is I, I quit drinking and I get this like a knot in my stomach. And it's okay, and I can get by on it, but it starts to tighten every day. And that knot gets tighter and tighter. And my wife becomes a bitch, possible to live with. My children become blood-sucking, bloody loin fruit. The job becomes a real pain, and everybody's taking advantage of my vast skill and ability, and they're just making use of me, not paying me enough money. And people generally just, you're a pain. I don't like you around. You're taking advantage of my good nature, and generally things are just not well. And finances are going to hell, and I'm just, I'm just bloody hell. I don't trumpy, and I don't like where I am. And I'm just going to have a drink. And I have a drink. And I pick up that drink. And as, I, as that first drink goes down, I don't think, oh, that tasted nice. I'll have another one. As that first drink goes down, that knot sta starts to unravel. It starts to loosen. And I think, oh, okay. And by the time I've had the second drink, that sense of ease and comfort has come through. And the wife's quite good, you know. She's not a bad old duck. She's a good chick. And the family and the kids, you know, they're just, they're just kids and they're a little bit boisterous. And there's a good bunch of guys at work and everything's okay. They're really, they're okay. And I like being with my buddies. They're a little bit of a pain in the house, but really they're okay. And really, who gives a shit about the rent? I'll pay that next month. And alcohol fixes my life. It just makes everything seem better. It changes my perception of life. Good. It would be good. Except there's a couple of little problems for me with that. A couple of little things that happen. First off is I can't, I never just have a couple of drinks and unwind. I have a couple of drinks and I unravel. That, that physical thing kicks in and I just go berserk. So I can't just have a couple of drinks. Maybe if I could, I'd be okay. But I don't. I, have, I always have more than that. And the next thing that happened, which I still think is a little bit unfair, is that alcohol stopped doing those things for me. Those things that used to help, those things that used to do for me, the things that I couldn't do for myself and alcohol did for me, it stopped doing that. It didn't matter that I drank. I, I just, my wife couldn't, didn't get better. She just, I, I started to lose my wife. I started to lose my family. I started to lose my job. I was always having financial problems. None of my friends wanted to be around me. Alcohol started to cause the very problems that I was using it to cure. So obviously I was not drinking enough of this stuff. 
So I would drink more and more of it to try and find that. And every now and then, it would give it to me. It would give me that, that touch or that taste of that ease and comfort that I used to have, and that would tie me in again. And I knew that I was in the right place, and I'd keep going for that. And the other problem, of course, with it was while when alcohol changed my perception, it gave me a false perception of life. So it made things look better, but it was a false perception. And I made a lot of decisions on that false perception. That if you make any decision on something that's untrue or something that's false, nine times out of ten, the result of that decision is going to be a disaster. And I, mine was a disaster. And I became, uh, my life just became absolutely unmanageable. I... I was doing pretty well before the drinking got on top of me. We had a couple of properties, etc. And I woke up in the middle of the night. I'd wake up in the middle of the night after passing out with that sort of that anxiety attack. You know, that, that sort of thing, that knot in your stomach. You sit bolt upright in, in bed and you're just, and I know I can't get back to sleep. And I think, God, and I just, absolute fear and anxiety. And I'd go through and I'd have a couple of drinks just to calm myself down. And I'd, I'd have a couple of drinks just to ease the panic or the just interest sake. You know the difference between anxiety and panic for the men out there? Anxiety is the second time you can't do it twice, and the panic is the first time you can't do it once. So, so the, just, <laughs> the, that feeling of absolute panic and anxiety that would come would be softened by a couple of drinks, and I would my, my perspective would change and I'd calm down and I'd start that unwinding process and I would start to think. And then I'd think, well, maybe, you know, if I sold one of the properties, I would be okay. And I'd think about that. It's a cool idea. What a wonderful idea. Because my problem wasn't that I was drinking. My problem was that I didn't have enough money. And if I had enough money, then I wouldn't have all these other problems and I wouldn't have to drink. So I would do that. And my, the perception that I had when I was drinking carried over to the next day and I sold the property. And then I was all right for a while. Didn't stop drinking, but I was all right for a while. The same thing happened to me a couple of years later. So I sell another property and now I've sold a house in which I live. All based on a perception that I had when I was drinking. So I end up, I'm, I've got no properties left. I'm renting a house. My, ha my life is an absolute disaster. The other thing as well that with my drinking, because I've been drinking for quite a long time, is that I've always used alcohol as a means of coping with my emotions. I've never coped with my emotions. I've always used alcohol. So if I'm cross, I, I, I drink. If I'm happy, I drink. Whatever happens in my life, I use alcohol to cope with it. So I don't know how to handle my emotions. When, by, by the time I'm in my 40s, I'm, I, I have the emotional maturity of a 20-year-old. And I've lost all touch with God. I'm a, I'm a recovering Catholic, and I um, have all the hang-ups that come with that faith, and I really believe that what was happening, uh, you know, with what I was doing when I was drinking, I was going to hell, and that God wanted nothing to do with me. So I, I had lost everything with God, and that's when I, when I came into these rooms. Now, if you come into the rooms like that, where you're absolutely obsessed with alcohol as I was, well, I have this ins insane idea that somehow I can drink normally. I have the emotional maturity of a 20-year-old. I'm spiritually but fret I'm, I'm physically a mess I'm just an absolute basket case so if I stop drinking all I am is a sober basket case no different, I'm just a sober basket case how do I change that, how do I sort out all that problems, how do I stop relying on alcohol to do for me what I could not do for myself and you gave me a program and you said to me, do this program, and if you do this program, you'll start to sort it out. So I did, and it started to work, and I started to get right. And I got to the point when I, it was just wonderful. I'm not telling you that I'm great at this program thing, but I know that it works in my life. And I know what I need to do in order to live a better life, and I no longer need to have alcohol do for me, which I cannot do for myself. I now I have God doing for me what I cannot do for myself, and it's a much better place to be. He's much better at it than alcohol was, and he doesn't give me a hangover. 
Um, so it, it, you've helped me with that, but that in itself was not enough. And I knew that there has to be more to this. There has to be more to this thing. I can't just sit and look after myself. All my life I've been looking after myself. It's been Frank Elian, and I've done what I wanted to do. I needed to be part of something bigger. And I sit in this room and I look at all these people and I know I'm a part of something much bigger. How do I come to be part of that? How do I come to be a part of that? And the answer is service. Joe mentioned it. As soon as I start washing that dish in that, or that cup, I'm no longer just visiting that room. I am now a part of that group. And I become a part of it that way. As soon as I start doing service, I become to feel a part of something much better than I am. I hear people all the time talking about being grateful. I am tremendously grateful to be sober. I'm tremendously grateful that I find Alcoholics Anonymous. I really am. But I'm not convinced, for me, that gratitude is something I can tell you about. Gratitude is something, surely, you have to demonstrate. How do you demonstrate gratitude? It's a little bit like sexy, isn't it? If you have to tell somebody you're sexy, chances are pretty good that you're not there, but you know? And gratitude's like that. I don't need, I, I can't tell people I have to show it. And how can, I, how can I show my gratitude? How can I show that I am grateful for what I have? This grateful for this new life, the fact that I have my family and everything back, how do I show that? I show that by doing service. Great place to be. The other thing, of course, is the, 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 the solution to my problem, the book tells me, is a relationship with a power greater than myself. It's a spiritual experience. No other solution. That's what AA offers us. That's our solution. So how do I develop a relationship with a power greater than myself? How do I get there? And we all know what a relationship is. A relationship requires two people. Well, maybe if you're lucky, a couple more. But anyway, but for both of us, it's... It's two people. I know what God's job is in this relationship. He's got to get me sober. He's got to get my wife back. He's got to get the job sorted out. He's got a lot to do. What do I do? What do I have to do in order to contribute to that relationship so that I do have a relationship with a higher power? And there's another book somewhere that says, what you do for mine, you do for me. And that's what I have to do. I do for others. I just get involved in the service thing. And it helps me to develop a relationship with God. And I have a relationship with God like I've never had before in my life. And I also have a reason for being around. I have a reason that I exist. There's a reason that I'm on, my, on this planet. I think it was Mark Twain who said, there'll be two great events in your life. One, you'll be born. And the second is you'll come to know why you were born. And thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous and all of you, I know why I was born. Thank you for listening to me. For the shorties. Hi, my name's Peter. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, it doesn't help not uh, uh, speaking third on a, on a specific subject because these guys will have covered everything by the time you get there, you know. But that's all right. You know, w one of the things that strikes me when you're up here is to see how many of you there are out there. And w we can call this thing helping others. We can call it service. We can do call it doing unto others. You know, just doing your bit. And I really think that each and every one of you has served this fellowship. You've served yourself. You've sought a path to ensure your sobriety just by being here. Because I'm quite sure that in making the effort, like all these people from KZN and Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, if there are any here, and even maybe further afield, who've come here, you make AA what it is. You know, it's well and good we can say well done to the convention committee, and while I'm about it, well done convention committee. You've done a great job. I've been involved before, and it's never been like this. So I want to thank you, and in your own time, you can all give yourselves uh, a big hand for being here. Uh, you've made this what it is. And uh, uh, Frank touched on, uh, and so did Joe, on on service, and I, I ask myself, really, 
What is being nice to you, any one of you here, or my wife, or my children, or the people I work with? What the hell has being nice to these people and serving them got to do with brandy and coke? You know, I, I have a deal. And my deal in life is to not drink. And surely that should be where my focus is. And if I have to ask myself, you know, I'm, I'm advised by AA that if all I ever do about my alcoholism is to stop drinking, I'm almost guaranteed I will start again. Because I need to understand as an alcoholic that my problem is drinking and my problem is also not drinking. You know, every day I wake up, I, I know I, I long ago did something about my drunkenness. I stopped drinking. But I have to ask myself on a daily basis, now that you've affected my thinking, what have I done or what am I going to do about being sober? Because this insane thinking that prompts me to pick up that first drink, which will nail me, just seem to stay there forever, you know? Knowing that I should stop drinking didn't do it. I, it tells me that knowledge of your problem is never going to help because that's not your problem, you know? You know your, your real problem, Peter Kay, Peter Kiley, is a lack of power to do anything about the need to start drinking again. You know, the big book makes it quite clear that if you don't drink, if you land up, then, then discussing what happens about drinking is, is just theoretical. It's gone as a problem. And they have a whole, whole exercise to show and prove that the problem really exists in the mind of every single person in this room. And certain of the things that we don't do are going to ensure that that your alcoholism catches up with you again. You know, I I, I read on the importance of service. How can, how can you say the importance of service? I googled service and sobriety and came up with about 500 quotes in an article from different people, including Albert Schweitzer and Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob and all of them. And to a T, every single one of those people said, if you're not in service in life, why not? What's wrong with you? You know? They also asked someone, some famous American dude, who saved a lot of people. He's about 50 odd years so it's not as much as Errol, I don't think, but he's getting there. <laughs> and uh, they said, what is this thing about about uh, recovery from alcoholism. How does it work? What's the thing that's going to happen? And he said, it's quite easy, really. He said, if you want to get the deal, then you need to understand that while I'm thinking of you, I'm not thinking of me. Now, it's good to know that, but how do you get there? How do you get to want to serve anybody? How do you get... I don't think I've ever jumped out of bed first thing in the morning and said, geez, I can't wait to serve somebody. It just hasn't happened, you know. I, I had a record, or a record, listen to me, a CD of Bob Dylan, and, and he went on some spiritual episode in his life. And one of the songs he sang uh, was, he was quite a poet, this boy, huh? sure he was, was you've got to serve somebody said, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord that you're going to have to serve somebody. And he gave examples of people from down there to up there. And these people, according to our Bob, Bob Dylan, if they didn't choose to serve, they can, you know, there are no benefits to reap. And uh, in in July the 3rd, 1950, was the first international AA convention, by the way. And I was four years old, for your information. And my mother, it reminds me, she sort of already knew as I progressed during school and on, she said, fella, 
She said, you should, if you, you should have gone straight from the maternity home to a meeting. It would have served, saved a lot of... It would have saved a lot of trouble for a lot of people. But uh, Dr. Bob was days virtually, maybe a month or so, away from dying. And when he stood up to give his farewell talk at this, still green, at this uh, AA convention, the first one, he says, and let me read it, because this poor man, he, he, he and Bill Wilson are not responsible for me standing here today, and my friends, and you, but them. And he said, there are two or three things that flashed into my mind on which it would be fitting to lay a little emphasis. One is the simplicity of our program. Let's not louse it up with Freudian complexes and things that are interesting to the scientific mind. We have very little to do which, but have very little to do with our actual AA work. But importantly, he said, our 12 steps, when simmered down to the last, resolve themselves into the words love and service. We understand what love is, and we understand what service is. So let's bear those two things in mind. I understand, probably the thing I truly understand is my lack of willingness just to get up and be there for anyone else. And probably the reason, as was mentioned earlier, that the nature of my disease and is me. The problem is self. The answer is a relationship with God. But the person who's not prepared to serve you is, most, is probably a, a, an, a, an aggressive, a uncompromising agnostic. You're not going to get him anywhere near any spiritual path. And I think Bill Wilson knew that. He knew that, and he made it clear that it's not important that you don't go along the path of seeking a relationship with God. So, uh, like, I understand from AA as well that as long as they give me a job to do, that job is going to change my mind. They said you're never going to think yourself into correct actions, into liking people and doing for them, but under instruction and with a bit of obedience in my life, I will act myself into correct thinking where you become important, become important. I think importantly for me is the statement that I heard that there's nothing that anyone in this room or that I know can do today to get me to take that first drink. But should I do it? then there's nothing that any of you can do to prevent me taking the second one. It's that powerful a killer, and I need to get there. I've, I've placed a good deal of faith in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because the end product of the program, of these 12 steps, is that I'm enabled to care for you to think of you and to not think of myself so much. Each one of the steps um, does something for me in that regard. It enables me to have a relationship with God of my understanding that I never had before. You know, importantly, I think it was also mentioned, it was mentioned by Frank that I, I, I think to myself on a daily basis with God as this huge, omnipresent figure. How will I ever know at the end of any day that what I have done, I've done for God? And they put the question, so it says in that other big book. They put the question straight to God. It said, how are we going to know? And as Frank was saying, out of the mouth of of God came the answer that as you do unto your brothers and sisters, yea, even unto the least amongst you, you do unto me. And there's the basis of the relationship. To me, I can see why I was stressed so much to get getting into doing for others. 
I, uh, I listened to uh, a well-known Asian religious man, a spiritual man, and he said, I envy all the people in Alcoholics Anonymous because me on my journey and all of you on your journey, you were speaking to another crowd, he said we could benefit from what they have and sometimes take for granted. He says they have a program. If we can see the benefit of living for others and doing for others, which means dying a little to yourself first, he says they have a program which removes the obstacles which prevents them from doing unto others as they would have them do unto them. And it's almost to me the key. If I don't want to live for you, I can suffer the consequences. If I feel like living for you, then I have a program and I have you. And uh, to carry on any more about it would labor the point. I just want to thank you for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of the convention. My name is, <clears throat> sorry, my name is Fani, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm sober by the grace of God and the actions of this fellowship. Yeah, I trust these trusted servants up here. I think they've not adequately covered the topic. Helping others is the foundation of our sobriety. Yeah, I always thought I was different. I heard a speaker on tape one day talk about something like, you know, the universal cry of the dying, drinking drunk is, but you don't understand. My case is really different. Of course, I laughed, you know. It didn't fully come through to me, but I came to AA and it wasn't pleasant first time. It was unpleasant. It was a shock because I was different. I felt sorry for them after a while. I wasn't welcome anywhere else, so I kept going because I knew that they actually stopped drinking. I drank before and after the meeting and attended meetings. And then they had things like if you've been drinking today, it's best that you don't speak. And I thought, well, if I don't speak, they're going to know I've been drinking, so I'll speak. <laughs> and I didn't know in my behavior, I was identifying with everything. And I came to AA for four years because they said the newcomer is the most important. I thought if I stay new, then I'm the most important. I should tell people, you can't speak to me like that. I'm the newcomer. Okay. And then things changed. Eventually, I found that I didn't have a drink for three weeks. Now, I had written myself off because I was so unique, terminally unique, special. This program was a common program for common drunks and no, it won't work for me. And I used what I could find in the program when I was drinking. Like I explained to people I'm an alcoholic and I'm powerless over alcohol. That's why they must leave me alone. I stay drunk. And eventually, after four years, I found myself three weeks dry and I was shocked. And I was overcome by some emotion. I wept because my bravado was on the outside. You know, I'm short and all that, so big bravado. And I thought to myself, you know, this God, you are amazing. I'm also a recovered Catholic. <laughs> and um, they also scared me because I didn't know I'd be, I believed in their perception of God. I still go to that church sometimes, and I sit next to people whose picture of God is my picture of the devil, and it doesn't upset me at all, because it's personal. Problem is they all think they're believing the same God. <laughs> so anyway, I was sober, and the first miracle happened for me. As soon as I realized that this God that they speak about has kept me sober, I started thinking about if he can do that, you know, he can get my wife and my children back because 
My wife left me. She fled. She always overreacted, and the children were kept away from me. And then I stopped, and I said something that I couldn't have thought of. I said, please free me of the obsession of getting my family back so I can stay sober. A few weeks later, she actually turned up. Someone told her I was sober. She said she won't believe it till she sees it. <laughs> it was a lovely meeting for me. She, um, this guy that she must have been living with, he didn't look well after I could see. She didn't recognize me because I looked so good. Anyway, and then, of course, the manipulation started, and I got into AA, and I did what, what I did. One of the things that, that I couldn't argue with, and I did argue, though, but I, I had to give in, that these people had something that I wanted. Not everything, I'm sorry. There's, you know, I sobered up in Mitchell's plane. There's a lot of things they had that I didn't want. And... Um, but there was something, I didn't understand, but there was something, you know. I didn't want trouble anymore. I knew I was going to miss alcohol. I didn't understand I was going to miss the effects of alcohol. It wasn't that deep. And, um, and I kept going, and there was definite some attraction, not all of them. There were some of them. I mean, Frank, I, I like correcting you. You said, you know, 90%, 10% of us have the disease. Not us in the hall here, yeah, it's the whole human race. <laughs> and also I found out it's strange that 10% of the human race is us. And 90% of the world is takers. And 10% are givers. And that's also in AA and everywhere we go. And I was a taker. I was also caught up in self. I was full of myself. I didn't prepare a speech. That's how full I am of myself. I thought I'm lost. I figured it out. I should be able to catch on to some of the things they said. <laughs> and there was a reading in the big book I was going to read. And they said there was going to be a book here. It's not here. So I can't read it. But of course, I do remember some things. I have been sober for, for, for 25 years. And um, abstinent for 25 years. I haven't always been sober, but I've had moments. But things have become better. My perception of reality is changing. My perception of God is changing. One of the biggest shifts is my, my, when I look back and reflect on the past, that even looks different. I'd, I'm not a victim anymore. That was my greatest obsession, was to look tough and be a victim. You know, the world owed me. You know, I had lots of issues with racists. I had a lot to say about them. And I discovered when I was almost two years sober that I was so racist, I thought you had to be white in order to qualify to be a racist. <laughs> So breaking through denial is not a nice thing. It's a painful thing. It is the lessening of my ego. I didn't know that I thought I was my ego. And I thought that people were judging me. They weren't judging me. They were judging this image I had created that I was hiding behind. If I relapse now, I'm sure I can handle jail again and insults and all kinds of stuff. I won't be able to live like a phony again. It will make me extremely uncomfortable. So we've got the uh, helping others is the foundation of our sobriety. Others mean everybody. The book is clear. If you can't help the alcoholic, you know. Do something up the family. I was so in my head about the wonderful talk I was going to give. I had a call. I had a couple of messages, and I looked at the phone, you know, I saw. And there was a call, and I knew who it was. It was the father of someone that I've been trying to help lately. He must be about two months sober. He had landed in hospital with withdrawals and, you know, the... Clonchi or seizures for the other people, it's seizures. 
And and I was irritated by it. But I took the call, and eventually later I could maybe help. And subtly my alcoholism has a way of shifting my priorities without me knowing. You know the thing? I know my primary purpose, blah, 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 blah. It shifts around. It shifts around. And I have to do what I have to do. And then it talks in the big book about a real purpose. While we are busy putting our lives in order, if I had written it, and unfortunately I didn't, I said, our little lives in order. This is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to be of maximum service to God and to the people about us. And I missed that point for a long time. I also miss the point of primary purpose. I don't have the power to carry out my primary purpose. My problem is I don't have the power. Lack of power, that's my dilemma. And in order for me to live into my purpose, I need to access that power. Conscious contact. It is my responsibility. I don't have to do it like anyone else. I need to do it from the experience of my life. I've got the drunk life. I've got a sober life. And I am not better off for what I know. I am responsible for what I know. And the whole purpose of me getting this gift of sobriety it's not for me, my little family, and my little career. I must give it away. I wasn't willing to give it away. When I started helping drunks, I was on an ego trip. And I'm not going to knock that now. At least I tried to help. Looking back now, I was on an ego trip. But I didn't know that then. I don't know in five years' time what kind of crap I was doing now. I do the best I can with what I have. We have this little recitation called the serenity prayer that we say before and after meetings. God grant me the serenity to accept what I can't change, courage to change what I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Most of my stress and obsessions today, I don't obsess about alcohol. I've been relieved of that obsession for now. Most of my obsessions come from my unconscious shifts in my purpose of what's priority. And most times my priority is the stuff that I should accept and leave, and I don't do what I can. I am asked and invited to do by this program only what I can. And I'm guaranteed that what I can't do will be done for me. So that I can become of effective use and get some self-worth. Because if I'm just sucking out of life, contributing nothing, I will have no worth. I don't think that I remember that from my life. Even in AA, I used to check out who drives fancy cars, who look like they could have something to do, who could help me out. And I'm not ashamed of that. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm just fucking glad, excuse me, that I know. So carrying the service isn't this drab thing that we speak about. If I go through the process, it becomes the natural result of the program. Somebody spoke about expression of gratitude. If I feel great, feelings aren't facts. If I feel gratitude, it will become, it will turn sour, without action. And it will become that old feeling of smugness, shame. There but for fortune goes you or I. Shame. There but for fortune. I'm so glad I'm sober. Look how he's laying in the park. That's smugness. If I put that gratitude to action, Something amazing happens to me. I have an ego like all of us, especially those who didn't know it, like all of us. It is not the same as self-worth. 
it is the opposite. My ego is my self-centered fear. It's my insecurity. Where's the load shedding when I want it? <laughs> <laughs> so the service thing, it is not me doing anyone a favor. It appears to my mind like that. When I do service, something amazing happens to me and something beautiful happens to me about my worth and my love for me. Because we say these things in the rooms, I can't love you if I don't love me. I can't have a healthy relationship with anyone if I don't have one with me. So the people that are also judged, and I judge in AA, the ones who say I'm arrogant, are the ones who are struggling to keep up with their false humility. We just have to be who the hell we are and become more of that, and with that, we pass on. The result isn't mine. I believe there's a higher power, and the result is there. So thank you for listening to me. It's an amazing convention. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.